very happy to have the opportunity to, to uh, tell you a bit about our project Accelerate. And as Jeremy said, basically this project goes actually back quite a while and um, a lot of people have contributed to the project. So at the moment, basically the core team consists um, of Trevor, Eva, David and Josh, but we, there are lots of um, thesis students involved who um, contribute with codes, ideas and um, discussion. So um, in the talk today, I basically want to give an overview of what Accelerate is. And in this seminar series, there were kind of a lot of other languages basically in this space. So I want to give a bit of a background and also the history and how um, Accelerate fits into this space. Um, also, I want to tell you about what's kind of currently happening and um, then where we want to take um, Accelerate in the future. Um, so Accelerate started um, in some sense, basically as a spin-off of another project, Data Pearl Haskell, which um, I worked on together with Manuel Takravaki and um, Simon uh, PJ and uh, lots of other people. And um, in, um, then it was still uh, in, in, um, Sydney, as I said, but now basically the team members at least Accelerate are based in Utrecht. And just a few words about what Data Parallel Haskell was. So with Data Parallel Haskell, we started from a very ambitious idea. We took the uh, nested Data Parallel programming model of Nestle and kind of generalized it further by trying to support even more, uh, more data structures and um, integrate it into the Glasgow Haskell compiler and try to basically use actually GHC to get it to map efficiently to concrete architectures. And that was ambitious from, for two main reasons. One is, as I said, it is a very powerful programming model. And secondly, um, it was a bit of a struggle to get GHC to do exactly what we wanted it to do because it was not built um, really for, for these optimizations. Uh, but a lot of, I think, useful things came out of that project. Um, and with Accelerate, we started from a different point of view. So we started with a fairly simple programming model, um, nested regular data parallelism. And um, starting from that simple model, basically the, the idea was to kind of generalize it over time to then support more uh, complex, basically pattern, irregular patterns, but, but a restricted form of them. And initially the aim was basically to give Haskell programmers a low overhead way to exploit the architecture they have, like the, you know, the GPU, the multiple cores, on their desktop and laptop machine to um, achieve performance. So this aim basically also um, has kind of two aspects to it. One is of course performance, but the other also is to make it easy for an Haskell programmer to use it. So part really 50% of our research, you can say is, is kind of about performance, but uh, a lot of our research also is how can we integrate this language into Pascal in a, in a smooth way. And as I said, we don't really want to depend on GHCs for optimizations for the really kind of performance critical part. So the consequence was that it's not, um, it's basically a language deeply embedded in Haskell. So um, we have explicitly the abstract syntax tree of the Accelerate program and write the compiler that maps this abstract syntax tree to the various architectures completely ourselves, but it's embedded in Haskell. So um, the way it works like with kind of a, a deeply embedded programming languages in general. So the programmer writes their Haskell um, program with the deeply embedded Accelerate, Part and then GHC compiles it 
an executable. And then why during Haskell runtime, the Accelerate program is generated um, and then compiled and sent to depending on what um, target architecture you're using, kind of GPU or the CPU, it's executed, the result is copied back to Haskell. And this can basically repeat multiple times over the runtime of the program. Whereas usually basically, uh, the, if, if the code stays the same, then the compilation part does not repeat and, and we basically memorize um, or cache the, the generated code. So uh, the Accelerate compiler tries to be smart about the way it's dealing with this. And then um, like many languages which have been presented in this seminar series, this kind of the, the data per computations are expressed via operations on multi-dimensional arrays. And um, in Adam's presentation of the DEX language, he, he used this syntax benchmark. And I thought that was a very nice idea because it, it um, put it kind of nicely in this space of, of other languages. So I decided to kind of steal this idea and continue with it. So um, Adam present this kind of how you can express uh, matrix multiplication, for example, in NumPy, in single assignment C, in DEX, and um, Futak, the Futak talk came, I think, afterwards, so this, that was not on the slides, and you can see with NumPy, so and DEX, it's um, how um, it's basically index-based, and um, with Futak, you can also see that Futag has these size parameters. So you basically give the state that you have an N times M matrix and an M times P matrix as arguments. And then the result is an N times P matrix. And um, in Futag, you have maps and reduce and transpose to express this computation. Um, now let me show you ways to express matrix multiplication in Accelerate. So just the type, again, you have two matrices and as argument, um, you return a matrix and it's generalized over any kind of numeric type. And one way to express it is also kind of fairly similar to um, the examples we saw apart from Futag, we can basically express it in an index space, um, as an index space computation. So we pass a function um, from a three-dimensional index basically of the target um, matrix and um, state how that index should be calculated. So it um, indexes indexes into the first and the second array at the corresponding points, multiplies it, and then we call sum on it. And in contrast to languages like DEX, which abstract basically over the shape of um, the matrices. So in our case, you have to pass that to generate. So I have to give generate the size of this intermediate array of three-dimensional array of products I pass. And then um, where do I get the shape from? So I extract, basically check what uh, the two uh, source arrays have for sh uh, shape, and then I pass it to it. Another way to um, express exactly the same computation is closer to food hug. So we use SIP with, that's like the map to in food hug. Um, to multiply pointwise the two arrays, um, R REPL and B REPL. And these are basically um, the expanded input arrays expanded at the corresponding dimensions. And first kind of, I have to take the second input matrix, transpose it, expand it, and expand the first one and then um, calculate it. 
And if you think that's too much work and too many people have already thought about how to implement um, matrix multiplication efficiently, then you can just call matrix multiplication directly. And this actually is a call to the BLAS library. Um, and the reason I'm mentioning it is Accelerate Basic also has a um, foreign function interface. So the idea is like Fourier transformation, matrix multiplication, all these things, people put a lot of work and uh, smarts into implementing it properly. So you can kind of connect to these libraries um, for BLAS, uh, we already have that, uh, but but user can also write um, write connections to uh, other libraries they want to. Um, but let me talk a little bit, basically talk a little bit on this index space versus point pre because I think that also came up in previous um, like when we looked at, at other languages. So. Accelerate offers this set of um, second order array operations. And it's really in, in many respects um, similar to Foothawk in that. So it has maps, zip width, stencil um, operations, scans and folds, permutations, back permutations, um, then uh, control structures like conditional while loops and such on array and um, scalar level. Um, now, most of this, uh, many of the specialized functions, um, actually many of them are used in the in the matrix operation, like zip with replicate or transpose, can actually be expressed via generate. So generate is this function that takes the sh shape of the result and a function that for any um, position in the result tells me how to calculate that value. However, um, the idea is that whenever you know more about an operation, you know it's a map of um, or a, a replicate or a, a permutation, then it's actually the better idea to use this specialized function because Accelerate does not try to analyze the, the kind of loop structure or the dependencies in Generate. But if you use transpose directly, these patterns are exposed. And now you can look at this second implementation of matrix multiplication and um, worry about all these intermediate data structures and, and it looks a lot more inefficient than the generate version. But like with all these um, languages which use um, second order, um, operations, we do implement fusions. So the, these intermediate structures are fused away and the memory access patterns are actually because they're more explicit, in this case, really the matrix multiplication, this version is more efficient than the generate version. Um, our fusion at the moment basically only fuses, so is fairly conservative. So it only fuses uh, structures which are not used a second time. So basically it never copies um, work as a result, result of fusion. I say conservatively because often in many cases it's actually kind of duplicating work can be the better strategy if that reduces uh, the number of memory access you have. Um, and I will talk about this a little bit later. So um, I want to have a closer look at the types of the operations we use because like as so often in Haskell, the types actually do tell you a lot about what's happening. So we use this sum function and I don't know if you picked up on that, but in contrast to all the other examples, which all used a kind of reduce or some corresponding operation, but they used it inside the a loop. Whereas our sum is on the outside, which might seem a bit strange because what you do is really for this, for the uh, matrix multiple 
reduction, you, you reduce kind of this inner dimension. So if we look at what sum actually is, we can see what's going on. So sum is just basically a shortcut to fold, um, not fold left, fold right, but basically pre-fold a parallel fold um, with the addition operator and zero. And um, I just want to look at one part of the type for now is, if you look at what the input matrix is, it is an array and then it has this strange argument type. So it says given a shape and you could say basically that is a dimension given an array of dimension n plus one, it will return an array of dimension n. So, Unfortunately, not like full type, we don't have size inference, but what we do have is basically, um, it's kind of rank polymorphism. And this fold operation works on arrays of any rank and basically of rank n plus one and always reduces the inner mouse um, uh, dimension. And that's why the, uh, it was not a map sum, but basically a sum. Here. And these shapes are basically just kind of represented as a snog list with the zero dimension as nil, and then um, kind of an integer to describe the size of each dimension. And then um, I had in, in my type, I just talked about matrices. So matrix is just a synonym for an array of dimension two. And if you look at it, like a, the dimensions are just basically set is zero dimension and so on. So um, in the matrix multiplication program also, I used as an index, not a term of this snock list of, um, numbers, but we put in a bit of syntactic sugar, such as index, index three of i, j, and k, basically indexed into the array. And I'm, I'm talking um, about this, go give me a bit more information about this a bit later, but that was the corresponding thing in the program. So um, what we also do in, um, on the tire cover is basically, for example, for replicate um, and slicing things out of matrices, like you might know from, from MATLAB, is we check that the shapes of the matrices basically correspond to the uh, 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 legal with respect to the um, ways we want to, the things we want to cut out of the matrix. So we can't obviously kind of cut, uh, if you have a two dimensional matrix, we can cut vectors or scalars, but we can't uh, cut a three dimensional matrix out of a uh, one dimensional matrix. And um, so for example, in this replicate example, in the matrix multiplication, I expanded basically um, different dimensions in the array or the transposed array. And the type checker made sure that um, the, the expansion parameter um, is basically um, correct with respect to the shape of the input matrix. Um, so that was basically the shape um, aspect of the type. Now, um, the second aspect is this ELF type class. So fault basically is, is works on any um, type A, so any matrix type with um, content A that is in this L type class. So, so it describes all um, arrays which we can represent and accelerate. And 
of what kind of arrays can we have? We can have all the usual members of kind of base classes, like uh, various floating points, ints of various sizes, word, character, boolean, and so on. Then we can also have arrays of shapes and indices. Um, we can have arrays of tuples. We can also have array of some types. For example, we can have array of maybe types. So if um, maybe is like for other languages an option type, which can be nothing or just the value. And as long as basically A is an element type, then maybe A is also an element type, legal element type in the array. Um, now, what about user-defined data types? Well, um, if a user in the embed wants to basically add a new data type into Accelerate, then the Accelerate compiler needs to know how to represent this um, data type basically internally in, in the matrix because it needs to map that efficiently to memory. Um, and for that, we have this basically, so there's the ELT um, class is extendable and it has basically three main members. So one is an associated type. And this is really just basically a mapping from the type A to the representation type. Um, how, how it should be um, represented in memory. And then um, it needs to conversion function, basically given an A, how can I convert it into this representation type? And given a representation, how can I convert it back? And if you as the user are happy, basically trust us and, and think that we'll come up with the proper representation. So they are basically default representations. So we, uh, if, if it's a product type, then an array of, of tuples is represented as tuple arrays, fairly basically standard. And um, an array of some types is represented as an array or arrays of the data types plus a flag array that tells me basically from which, um, from which type uh, the uh, alternative was. So that's basically the standard uh, thing you get free. Um, arrays so itself are not in the element type class. So we can have multi-dimensional arrays, but we cannot have arrays of arrays because that would mean that the, we would act kind of support irregular data structures directly, which unfortunately we don't, um, uh, because the arrays could be like the individual elements could be of different sizes. Um, so ragged or irregular matrices are not directly supported and you have to basically manually flatten them. So if, if you want to, um, write a program processing these arrays. So we have um, operations, segmented operations. So for example, for fold, um, we have a segmented version that gets um, a multidimensional array. And then um, also basically the segment sizes of the the database and, and uh, folds it along the segment sizes. So then the if you want to express kind of sparse matrix uh, vector multiplication, and you have this uh, the standard kind of compressed row format, you basically um, permute the elements, the data elements in the right order, and then kind of uh, call fold set on that. Um, so Finally, basically the, the, the last part of the type um, of the functions we're using 
which we have to look at uh, kind of this X, X and Ak type. So if you look at them, basically um, the arrays we pass, the array we pass into the fold is not just an array, but is wrapped into the Ak type. And that is just, I mentioned in the beginning, it's a deeply embedded language. So even though it looks uh, very much like we're expressing computations, what we really do is we express the ways in which abstract syntax trees, which represent this computation, get combined. So fold, and, and here kind of an, something of type XA is basically a syntax tree, an abstract syntax tree that represents a sequential calculation, which results in a value A and um, something of type ACK or, um, represents um, a parallel computation of an array. So we um, distinguish on the type level between sequential and parallel operations, which is one way in which we statically ensure that users don't accidentally um, introduce basically nested parallelism, which we could not map um, efficiently to um, the, the concrete architecture. So it gets basically checked at the compile time of the Haskell program and rejected at the compile time of the Haskell program. Um, whereas if we would just check it basically during compilation of the Accelerate program, that's remember the, the diagram from the beginning that would basically be during the compile uh, the runtime of the Pasco program. So we try to exclude that basically by making the construction of these nested irregular programs impossible. Um, now, once we have these nice trees um, of, of computation, of course, we need a method to actually execute it and, and run it. And this is run, which has basically kind of simplified the type, takes an ACK A and compiles it, sends it to the device and um, returns the value A. Now, usually that's not what you want because it would mean that whenever you have a different function applied to different argument, it gets recom recompiled. Um, what you usually want is um, something of, again, slightly simplified type. This run and it gets a computation over matrices, um, compiles that code, and then you can apply it to values of type A, and it uses the same code for that. So the difference between run N and run Q is kind of, you can, the default is that um, compilation of Accelerate program happens at Haskell program runtime. But if you have a static program, then you might prefer to actually compile the Accelerate program at Haskell compile time because you don't pay that extra overhead in the runtime and then you can call run queue. But basically these are the uh, ways to evaluate the abstract syntax trees. We don't have something that evaluates an expression um, type because the expression types are arguments just to into parallel computations. And they are such a very, um, they, they don't make much sense um, in isolation. Now, um, so I showed you how to get something out of the act type. Now, we have to also kind of lift the regular Haskell values into our embedded language. And if um, we already have overloaded values, that's um, relatively easy and can be basically hidden from the user or the, computer, the user can be shielded from the inconvenience of lifting these values into the language fairly easily. We have, for example, for the numeric values, we just basically uh, overload all the operations on numeric values further to work also on expressions. And then I use addition just like I'm used to 
and can more or less ignore the fact that it's addition, that it's a constructor in the abstract syntax tree and not really um, operation. Um, unfortunately, it's not that easy for values which are not already overloaded. So for example, let's say I want to just write um, not function in um, kind of the embedded language. And what I would like to write is something that, that looks very much like a regular Haskell program, right? Just as my calculation matrices look pretty much like a regular um, addition fold and so on. So I might want to write this. And of course, the type checker will complain because true and false are Boolean values and not expression rules. And that's on both sides. OK, so I do need an operation that kind of takes an A and lifts it into the expression language. And then I can, um, and again, the type here is a bit simplified because, of course, it's, it's restricted to element types and so on, but that's not very interesting. OK, so when I use this, I lift these true and false values, and now the result type is OK, but the argument type is still a problem. So. Luckily, I can. Um, there's a um, accelerate function that takes basically is like a conditional, takes a boolean expression and kind of a then and an else expression and gives me um, an expression tree that um, expresses this conditional. So I can do it like this, and that would be fine. Um, it's fine in the sense that the type checker won't complain, but it's not nice from the point of view, uh, which I mentioned in the beginning, that, that we want to basically have, a, we want to have a smooth integration. That's not code I want to write, right? I like pattern matching. I, I like functional programming. I like Haskell. I really want to uh, use pattern matching also in my embedded language. And if I can't, that's a bit of, um, yeah. A shame. So how can we use pattern matching on embedded expressions in, in Accelerate then? So in general, it's not possible. It's easy. I can always lift something in the expression language, but taking it out of the expression language, basically um, like this, this is not generally possible because like not at, at the compile time of the, of the Haskell program, because well, it's an expression free, it's a calculation. So the only way to get to the value in general is to actually evaluate the expression. And that's the only way I can do a uh, pattern matching on. Well, at least if we know that what the topmost constructor of a type is, then I can do a bit of unlifting basically. So I can, if I have an expression of type, um, result type pair of AD, then I, the, the topmost constructor of this expression is the pair constructor. So I can kind of unlift it one level um, because I know that it will be two expressions. So for example, for this swap function, I could, um, I get this expression tree um, that which returns a pair. I can unlift it so that I can um, refer to the two sub expressions, then swap them, put them in a pair, and lift them back up into the language. Um, again, it works, it type checks. It's a problem though that with the, all the overloading, so there, there are two problems. Again, it's actually a bit, you know, it's not nice that the user has to worry about lifting and unlifting. Secondly, you have to overload these lift and unlift functions. And um, the type checker in many situations can't resolve the overloading. So, the user has to provide type annotations. And if they don't, they see all kind of horrible type error messages, which kind of show actually internals of the embedded language. So it's pretty um, ugly. And it was really one of the big, um, I would say the biggest hurdle for a lot of people starting to use um, Accelerate. So 
Um, we can solve that. Luckily, we use Haskell patterns, synonyms, synonyms and view patterns to have these kind of smart constructors and, and can have these aliases, basically of synonyms um, for both pattern matching and um, constructing. So unfortunately, we can't overload the pair constructor. So we have, because of namespacing, we have to um, give it a different name. So for pairs, two tuples, we have T2, and we can use that as a constructor and as a basic uh, on the pattern matching side. So I can write my swap like this. I don't have to provide type annotations. It's not perfect because, well, I have to use this different constructor. And I mentioned in the um, matrix multiplication, this I3, um, because here, this is exactly the same thing. So it takes a shape expression, pulls it down basically to the um, level that I can um, pattern match on it here. And then here is the constructor, which in the background lifts it. So I can, the, the, these, these uh, patterns and names hide the, the, what's going on pretty well. Unfortunately, I said in the beginning, we can easily do that if um, we have types with it, just the single topmost constructor. But this example I had in the beginning not operated on bools, and bools has two, true and false. So it doesn't work for, for Boolean values. Um, like that. So what can we do there? Um, we um, introduce basically, so if you define your own um, data type, you can use deriving ELT to derive the methods I told you pre about previously, basically the ELT representation and to and from operation. And if you also derive generic, so generic kind of maps um, algebraic data types to its components. And if your type is not recursive, we don't know automatically how to um, use it recursively, then by some template Haskell magic, if you put in this, make me a pattern for my new data type, then afterwards you can use left and right as patterns and constructors. Again, slight kind of uh, downside, left and right, we can't use directly. So we use this left under, we, we generate the pattern and construct this left underscore and right underscore. So that's just the same as we couldn't use uh, the pair constructor directly, but now I can, do pattern matching on my embedded expressions. And if you ignore the underscore, it feels really a lot like, um, like Haskell. Um, you have to then basically uh, on, on these functions call um, this match function that generates in the background, basically transforms this operation into one which in the generated code has the case distinction, the pattern matching code in it. Um, so that I hope gave you a bit of an overview of what the language is, what it can do um, at the moment. And now I want to tell you briefly about kind of what's going on currently in the sense that it's almost done and we hope to actually release the work fairly soon. Um, we already have a kind of um, back end that at least uh, for, the, the, for the interpreter works mostly. So this is mainly the work of Ivo and David, who I mentioned in the beginning. So what they did in the last uh, uh, one, one and a half, it's hard with COVID to actually quantify the time, but in the last time is they rewrote the whole compiler pipeline. Um, and like as this goes, it's basically with these compiler pipelines, it's all or nothing. You don't have to show any, there's not much to show. Um, 
uh, unless you're done completely. So we're almost there. And what can the new compiler pipeline do? So um, it will pretty dramatically improve the type of fusion we can do. Um, so I told you in the beginning uh, that, that it's kind of for the straight cases, it, it's pretty reliable, but, but there are things where it's a bit diff more difficult to decide and where we are basically um, fairly conservative at the moment. Then uh, this will enable internally to have destructive updates. And one thing we wanted to have for a really long time was um, that we give more control to the user so they can specify different schedules um, easily, which was not possible at all before. So what is the issue with the improved fusion? So currently, as I said, like intermediate areas with data issues only once are reliably fused, work is never duplicated. Um, in the new pipeline, um, it will be possible to have horizontal, um, vertical, basically coupling and, and the normal fusion. And fusion where I uh, kind of would call diagonal fusion, where I fuse a computation into a following um, calculation, but still keep the argument around uh, because that uh, does not um, stop me from having extra data structures where I have the intermediate value, but um, memory access is, is greatly improved. And it takes the estimated cost of operations into account um, and using basically an IRP solver to find um, a more efficient schedule because finding the optimal kind of fusion schedule is um, NP hard problem. So uh, that you uh, can't put that analysis into the file. So I'm not talking uh, much more about fusion because also we, we had in this series already talks um, about fusion, but that should be um, a lot better. Um, the next thing which we um, are working on at the moment and which should um, be in the next uh, release is currently basically like, it's a functional language, so we don't have destructive updates. And um, again, unlike Foothook, or we don't have these linear or, or uniqueness types where we track that in the embedded language. Um, but so, and it's usually not a problem if I iterate over the complete array, then um, Accelerate is pretty good at managing that. But where it really becomes a performance bottleneck is um, when I have a large array and in each iteration, I just update uh, small parts of it. Then obviously I don't want to kind of copy everything. And what I really need is a, is a destructive update there and kind of these permute operations. Um, this is just one um, example of that. And it's, it's really used in a larger uh, uh, class of algorithms. But I guess I, I don't have to uh, convince you that, that destructive updates are important. So what uh, we can do in the new pipeline is basically not on the type level, but base kind of have an analysis in on the AST to figure out which of the arrays are only used once and then internally use a destructive update. So it's not basically, so, so we have side effects internally, but they're not visible to the outside. Um, and then thirdly, um, as I said, the kind of one thing we wanted to have for a long time was that users can uh, have more influence on what kind of uh, schedule to pick. And that was really, couldn't be done in the old representation because in the uh, abstract syntax tree, we did not uh, model or express the schedules explicitly. So when generating the code, the, the schedule had to basically the code generator had to pick a schedule so it could not be integrated into the analysis and that is possible now and then um, it's really kind of um, 
in a fairly abstract way, the user can influence these schedules. So I won't go into details there. That's, the fusion is, is mainly David, David's work and um, Evo is working on um, these schedules. So I hope that, that Evo is soon in the, um, can, can give more information about how that um, works in detail. So what I told you basically so far is, is work which is almost almost done um, and, and we hope to be able to release soon. And now just kind of some um, basic bit of an outlook of where we want to go in the mid to near future, but what's not really kind of done yet and where the plan is still um, pretty open. So. Um, one project I'm uh, actually really excited about is um, we're working with some research from geosciences at uh, Utrecht University and the Dutch Institute, um, Dutch Royal Institute of Marine Research um, on the simulation basically of coastal development. So uh, kind of from salt marsh to peatland. And that is important because we need to understand how they develop because it, to protect the coasts from climate change. So with this transition from salt marsh to peat mar, peatland, um, the, um, you can basically kind of uh, counter the sea, possibly counter sea level rise. So it's very important to understand which factors can speed this development up. And um, what we're using basically to simulate this is essentially stencil computations. So Accelerate already offers these stencil computations, which are kind of more or less a, a general, a, like a special form of a, a variant of maps. So instead of kind of applying a function to just uh, one element in a matrix, you specify in Accelerate what your stencil shape looks like, and then um, you can write the stencil function on the stencil and kind of map over that. Um, and the work in this program, uh, in this project is kind of more efficient. So we're pretty good at ba basically dealing with this stencils on, on CPUs and also really competitive on GPUs. So we, um, the accelerate code we have for the simulation uh, is several times faster than their handwritten OpenCL code. But what we want to do is basically write more efficient um, schedules on the GPU, exploiting the fact that we know in these stencil computations that we know a lot um, about the patterns and um, we can basically tune that further. Then one thing that's again more speculative is in these simulations, there are areas where not a lot is happening in a time step, and then areas where the border speed is relatively high and a lot is happening. And at the moment, we can only simulate that with a kind of uniform time step. And it would be nice to have some abstraction that allows it to adapt um, to these different, different speeds and, and uh, make that more efficient. Um, and then what we're actually being paid for in the project so, um, is uh, to provide a better interface um, for the scientists which were, who work with Accelerate to visualize the data uh, more nicely. And that is really not uh, Accelerate specific. That will be kind of an Haskell like, interface. And, and we're looking into, that's basically a version of um, a Haskell version of Jupyter Notebooks, so something like this, uh, improve on this to make it easier for the scientists to work with it. Um, another thing, so it would probably not be this seminar series if you wouldn't work on automatic differentiation. Um, so Tom Smading, who was a master thesis student, is now a PhD student, he did a really um, interesting work on reverse automatic differentiation for Accelerate. And he um, identified some performance pain points. And we 
because we basically did not address them straight away because we knew that with the new compiler pipeline, we're in a much better position to address them. So one problem is that the code, accelerate code generated in his AD system looks nothing like the handwritten accelerate code we're optimizing for. So we look into this. Then for uh, his work really, Fusion is really important to have these um, more sophisticated fusion, which allows you to partially uh, fuse also shared values. And then there are a couple basically of memory management issues um, we need to look into. And one thing is uh, also kind of in this context of machine learning and automatic differentiation, um, as also was discussed previously in some previous talks, size in the inference actually um, becomes really more important because if you combine these transformations, it would be nice to have a size checker there. So um, that's basically the things we would like to work on in future. And that's um, all from me uh, about Accelerate. So thank you very much for uh, listening and yeah, it's Accelerate, of course, is an open source project. So if you want to have a look at it, play around with it or contribute, then um, yeah, uh, have a look at, at our project. Thank you.